welcome to Conversing the Classics, a Classical Youth Society Ireland podcast dedicated to discussing classical studies with the subject's experts. My name's Oscar McHale and I'm the founder and chair of CYSI. Today's topic is the Greek historian who, after Rome's defeat of Macedon and the Battle of Hydna in 168 BC, was shipped off to Rome where he found himself among the social elite of what was fast becoming the Mediterranean's new superpower. Fascinated by this, he decided to take up the vast task of recording, but most importantly, analysing it all. Joining me today to discuss the historian Polybius is Professor Brian McGing, Regis Professor of Ancient Greek in Trinity College, Dublin. Now, in 2010, he published Polybius, the Histories for the Oxford University Press. Professor McGing, thank you very much for joining me oh, today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, obviously, you've written a host of other publications before Polybius and are still publishing to this day. I suppose, what first sparked your interest in researching and writing a book about Polybius? Uh, yes, it's the, the, uh, the path of research goes in, uh, in hardly in a straight path or a straight direction. Various things happened. Polybius was an author that I had used frequently for the various studies I've made of Hellenistic history. That's the mm. history of the Mediterranean in the period after the death of Alexander the Great, and uh, but just before the Romans. So he was an author that I've used frequently, and then, quite simple really, I received an invitation to write the book, and it, uh, sometimes it works like that, sometimes that you, you, just, you just get offered yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. So I suppose, diving straight into Polybius, why are his writings important, and what themes does he use that make him worth studying? Right, well, that, that's uh, the, really, the really big question about Polybius, uh, is he just a, an author whose works happen to survive and therefore we should be interested in him or, or, or is there more? And um, I, there is more. He, he is one of the most important historians uh, that survives from, whose work survives from the ancient world. He wrote about the rise of Rome to imperial power in the period from the Hannibalic War, that's 218, to the destruction of Corinth and of Carthage in yes. 146. So there's what he calls a 53-year period, mm -hmm. exactly, where it, Rome uh, emerges as the superpower of, of, of the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. That's his grand theme. It's not simply an account. Uh, it is, as you say, analysis. He thinks a lot about it. Now, he thinks out loud as well. I'll, I'll come back to that. It, one of the important things to recognise, unfortunately, is that his work survives in fragmentary form. The first mm. five books are complete, and that takes us up to uh, the Battle of Cannae, the great victory that Hannibal achieved over the Romans in 217 mm. BC. And after that, the continuous account breaks off but we have very extensive fragments and Byzantine summaries of its work. So a great deal of what we're dealing with are bits and pieces of Polybius. There's a great deal of Book 12, which is about the writing of history. There's a great deal of Book 6, actually, which is the nature of the Roman constitution. Mm -hmm. He breaks off at three distinct points from his yes. narrative analysis, so to speak, to talk about history, to to talk about the Roman Constitution in Book 6, History in Book 12, and Geography in Book 34, which does not survive at all. So there are large chunks of other books of Polybius mm. for which we don't have the full text. The themes, yes, it's about the rise of Rome to imperial power, but it's also about how, how you do that, how they did it, mm. how they might keep empire, how you lose it, how... Others react to it. Smaller powers. How are they supposed to react? To so, would you would you would you argue that as as much as Polybius is first and foremost a historian, that he is also sort of in in a way writing a philosophical text, sort of analysing power. Uh, yes, in a way, it's it's not presented in the philosophical mode, but it is uh, a, a highly analytical account, uh, mm. he, and he breaks off his narrative repeatedly to discuss issues uh, mm. of fate, this very curious set of thoughts about mm. fate, uh, about geography. He's very keen on geography, very important that generals know geography and topography. Yeah. But he also has a, a rather theoretical view of geography, rather mm. strange elements. He's very interested in generals and warfare. 
and very interested overall, above all in many ways, mm. on, on how you should write history and how yeah. you should not write it. There's a great deal of thinking out loud about the process of, of writing mm. history. So he, he, there's a lot here because he is one of the authors, perhaps along with Herodotus, the author who speaks out most about what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, that's terribly useful. I mean, a great writer like Thucydides yes. doesn't actually say a huge amount yeah. about how he's and proceeding. Obviously, Thucydides is very non-journalistic compared to Herodotus, I suppose, so he, he doesn't almost need to. I mean, that would be well, my, yeah, my, yeah. my take on it. I mean, he does. There are obviously some very important uh, passages, and it's, it's, it's clear that it's an extraordinary uh, and powerful work that Thucydides wrote. But Polybius really does talk out loud a lot, or think out loud. This yeah. is what I think about all sorts of things. I mean, I I'm, would guess that He's a man who spent his adult life in the company of the most powerful people in the world, and that gives you a sort of confidence to pronounce yeah. on almost anything uh, with uh, great certitude. I suppose let's let's uh, start at the beginning of his life. Could you give us sort of a, a brief outline of his his early life and his his life in Greece and mm. that sort of mm. that sort of thing? He, he came from a, a, a political family in the uh, Peloponnese. Greece, at this time, uh, he was born probably 200 BC. There's a a debate, but Mm. let's just take that. It's usually accepted. (laughs) Greece at that time was controlled by three major groups, the the Achaean League in the Peloponnese, and he Mm. is from a political family, from leading political family from that context. The Aetolian League in central Greece and the, the Macedonian Kingdom in the north. Those are the three main units. Uh, there are independent units like uh, like Athens. Uh, so his uh, his family was very prominent in the Achaean mm. League. His father was the leader of the. He was elected the strategos, or the chief uh, yeah. commanding officer, or a rather difficult word to translate, of the Achaean League a number of times. And from what we can see. Polybius would have been brought up as a Greek aristocrat with full expectations of a political mm. career. He he talks, uh, I think he, he would have been about 16, he talks of being present at a conversation between his father and another leading Achaean mm. politician. So even as a teenager, he's been involved in yeah. In, in politics. So to develop on that, he's obviously a very influential, uh, in many ways probably was a very, very good politician. Do you think this he, this status was firstly won by nepotism or do you think he was just naturally very gifted in things like oratory and debating? Or do you think it was a mixture of both? Well, uh, he, he, it's a mixture of both. He, he, nepotism is very much a, a, a modern concept. Um, Greek politics and Roman politics at this time were highly aristocratic and mm. the expectation was that it was a, a, a sort of a, a family affair, mm. rather hard to break into as a new, what the Romans called a new man. So yes, he was brought on. Uh, he was, we were discussing or going to discuss his role in the funeral of the great Achaean politician Philip yeah. um, who died when Polybius was, well, what, 20, not even 20, 18. Mm. And Polybius was chosen to carry his ashes at the funeral. Now, his father was a very good friend of Philip Polybius' father, and it must be that his, his, his father gets, mm. gets him the, the job as a mark of the the friendship Mm. between the two families. He was also chosen to go on a diplomatic mission to Ptolemy V, king of Egypt, who died before the mission went. But again, his father was the leader of that mission, and he doesn't say, but you can be almost certain that his father swung it, that Mm -hmm. uh, his young son would would be part of it. So, I I mean, that's just the way politics worked in those days. Mm -hmm. We we hope it works differently now. I'm Mm -hmm. altogether sure it does always, but so the word nepotism isn't uh, perhaps a a, a terribly useful one, but if you mean uh, was his rise due to family connections, certainly was. From what we can see, uh, he actually, uh, before a big big change in his life uh, came about when he 
was uh, carted off to Italy. We, from what we can see, he, mm. he seems to have been very capable that he could persuade the Achaean assembly to do what he wanted and so on. So I think he was probably a very good politician. Now, now obviously you, you spoke there about his, uh, his role in 182 BC in the funeral of Philippeman. And obviously he was given the honour of carrying the urn with his ashes in it. Why, and I suppose to give our listeners some context, why was being allowed to carry the ashes at a, a Greek funeral so important? What, why, why, did it, why does he feel the need to record this and say, this is what I did? And he was very proud of this fact, obviously. Yes. Well, I mean, I think it's to do with Philip Poimene. Philip Poimene uh, was the man responsible for making the Achaean League the power of the uh, Peloponnese. Just, just to interrupt there, sorry, because I have... To give a bit of background, what exactly was the Achaean League? Well, it was a a federal organisation of the states of the Peloponnese. I mean, it's an interesting Mm. experiment in in government. Mm. Uh, Its headquarters were Megalopolis, and that's where Polybius uh, came from. So it was was the the body that ran the the Peloponnesian Mm. states and had its own structures. Mm. It had a boss, it had a second in command, Mm. and it debated its interests and, mm-hmm. and, and fought where, when it needed to. We, I mean, we don't know a lot of the details mm-hmm. of, of always what it did, but it was involved in really all the big affairs of, of history in this mm-hmm. period in, in, in Greece anyway. And I suppose, just, sorry, just get it, we went a little off track there, but I, I thought that that's obviously that's a big part of Polybius's mm-hmm. family history. But again, back to this, this significance of oh, car- yeah, carrying yeah. the, uh, I, I, I the mean, he, funeral urn. He makes it significant. I, I can't, thinking off the top of my head, think of lots of other occasions when people carry mm. funeral lines. But it is a mark, a young man mm. um, at the biggest funeral of the era, that he's the one who has, I suppose, but could you compare it to carrying a coffin at, a, at, at an Irish funeral? Uh, okay, so well, you probably could. It's a mark mm. of honour. Who gets to carry a coffin yeah. at a funeral? Uh, well, well only people who are really close, mm. uh, uh, either associates or yeah. friends. or uh, So it's, it's, it's simply a mark of his, mm. his place in the, uh, uh, in the political affairs, yeah. really, of the uh, Achaean League. Now, now, nearly 12 years later, and moving quite quickly on his, uh, his, his early life in Greece, around 170 BC, Polybius is elected Hipparchus. Hippa- Hipparchus. Hipparchus, yep. um, which is a cavalry commander. Is it, that's what it means. That would be a, mm-hmm. a good translation. Mm-hmm. Do we know if while he was fulfilling this role, he saw he was involved in any battles? Or while fulfilling these duties, and if so, was he a, was he a good general? Was he? Uh, well, I, I, it, it's it's a good question. Uh, the Hipparchus was the second in command of uh, the Achaean League. Uh, mm. Yes, it has a military title, as does the, the head of the League, the mm. Strategos. Uh, they have a military function, but also civil function. Mm. So by 170, he, he got to the number two position. I mean, I think what that shows is it was clear he was going to the top. Yes. There's no doubt he would have ended up as the, uh, the head of the League. The, the, the matter about his military experience is important because he says quite a lot about being a general, mm. uh, what's expected of uh, military commanders. And to be a historian, he says you really have to be a politician, a soldier politician. Mm. And he talks about... Um, risking yourself yeah. in the field. Yes. Uh, so what we do know, uh, one of the works that doesn't survive that Polybius wrote was mm. a work on tactics. And he was a recognised expert. Yeah. He, he, f- he was at uh, the siege of Carthage with uh, Scipio okay. Aemilianus in 147 yeah. as a military advisor. Oh, and I, I suppose, again, to put it in perspective... How many men was he in charge of when he was uh, second in command? Obviously, oh. a cavalry. How, mm. how, what were the cavalry numbers of the, the Achaean League? Don't know. You, no. I, no, I, I don't know. Uh, do we know? We probably... Well, we might. We probably have an idea. I mean, it, it's a very important role. There's yes. no question. He, he is one of the... And, of course, the... The, uh, the, the top yes. of, of the League. What he... I mean, what did he do? Well, we don't know. We don't know much about the League in the 170s, 160s. What action did he see is is a question that I just don't know 
okay. that we know the answer to. Yes. Mussini uh, rebelled against the League and the, the, the League fought mm-hmm. against Mussini. He may, one would have thought he'd be yeah. involved in that. I mean, all one can say is that uh, he, he was from a leading aristocratic family. He was being groomed for the leading yeah. position in the League. And you would expect that a, a, a young aristocrat would be trained in the ways of war yeah. uh, and so on as he grew up. But yeah. I'm not convinced we know what action he and saw. And do you actually think it might have been something to do with the fact, obviously, I, I, I think it's he, uh, he who mentions it, that he was, he was a very skilled rider and a very, uh, a very good huntsman. Do you think that this was part of the reason why he was chosen to command a cavalry corps, or do you just think that that was just a coincidence? I, well, I, I think, I mean, hunting was very much part of uh, aristocratic upbringing mm. uh, for uh, the Greeks. Alexander the Great was a keen huntsman. So it would be part of the expectations mm. of political office that you, yeah. you had all these and therefore of, of military office I, there is a strange story it mightn't come up again but there's a strange story that at the siege of Carthage in 147 uh, both Polybius and Scipio I mean Anus, took part in a an assault on a on a gate in the famous Roman tortoise that's where they yeah. hold the, the, the shields the, the, the over the head yeah. now what on earth Scipio or Polybius, <laughs> Polybius, who would be 50 in his yeah. 50s at that, at that stage, were doing mm. uh, in such a venture. I mean, it seems so improbable that it's unlikely. It's reported by the Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does raise that question. Well, what action did he actually see? see. And I, I'm just not sure. He was with a Roman commander at the invasion of Macedon and would have seen action there. He obviously saw action at Carthage. Well, he witnessed. I don't when we say see action, we tend to mean to take part in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he, he saw it literally mm-hmm. without necessarily taking part. But he, he would have been a commanding forces. Well, I, I, certainly as Hipparchus, uh, he, he would have. After that, he's not, he doesn't get a chance to mm-hmm. uh, command armies. His uh, career is, as, as we'll d- move on to discuss, yeah. uh, is interrupted by uh, Rome's victory in 168. But it is, it's an interesting matter, his own military experience, simply because he places such emphasis that you, you've got to put your life on the line in mm. the field. So we, we can assume that he's making these claims I, after being I, in the field. People usually assume this. I just wonder if he's a little defensive about it. Mm. I mean, I'm not going on an awful lot. He also says he's very critical of commanders who risk, army generals who risk their lives unnecessarily. I can't remember which Metellus it was, but he's highly critical of one who, Roman commander who loses his life in a minor engagement. That's a ridiculous thing. So he um, mustn't have been a fan of Alexander the Great then? Or well, do, do we know anything about what he thought of those who had come before him? Well, you don't know what he thought about Alexander. No, uh, he, he thinks a commander should be circumspect. No point a commander fighting and risking his life for nothing, for mm-hmm. no reason. It's got to be of benefit to the army as a whole, uh, mm-hmm. or the, the campaign as a whole. And he praises Hannibal for recognising that. Mm-hmm. And I think Scipio, probably Scipio Emilianus as well, he's a great um, military expert and seems to have been recognised as such. Yes. As, as I say, wrote a book on tactics. So it's just the assumption that we make that therefore he'd seen a lot of action, mm. um, not necessarily completely mm. safe. But we don't yeah. really know enough about uh, Achaean history in the 170s, 160s to, to, to know what, to know was, what, was, what was happening. Was yeah. After the defeat of the Macedonian king Perseus at the Battle of Pydna in 168 BC, he's brought to Rome as a, a, a captive, I, might be the correct term. Can you talk us through how the Romans went about dismantling the Greek city-state structure after the Battle of Pydna and what effect this had on Greece's future. This war that ended in, uh, with the Battle of Pydna was the, the so-called Third Macedonian mm-hmm. War. There'd been a war, technically a war between Rome and Macedon during the Second Punic War, during the war that Rome fought with Hannibal. Immediately after that, and was the reason that that was unsuccessful because because Rome just didn't have the resources to keep up fighting to 
or is against? Yeah, the, the, well, it's called, cool, obviously, this so-called first, first Macedonian War. It's really, it scarcely uh, deserves the title of war because Rome was too occupied with, with, Can- uh, Hannibal. with, with Hannibal and Philip. They, there was theoretically a state of hostilities between mm. the two. I, I mean, Rome, I, I would imagine, judging from how they behaved immediately after the war against Hannibal finished, Rome was pretty annoyed mm-hmm. uh, with the Macedonian king mm-hmm. Philip V because they immediately declared war and fought the so-called Second Macedonian Genial War, war. De- defeated Philip mm-hmm. V of Macedon and restrained him within yeah. the Macedonian kingdom. So he, this is now another war conducted by Philip's son, Perseus. And uh, with victory achieved, Rome lost patience with mm. Macedon. And in fact, what they do is dismantle the Macedonian monarchy. Now, this is the great, mm. it's not quite a direct line, but it is the uh, line of kings, uh, part of which, in a way, Alexander was uh, an earlier member of. So mm. uh, this is a fairly uh, dramatic moment in, in Macedonian history. They simply mm. cancel the Macedonian kingdom. You no longer yeah. exist and divide the country up into republics, um, separate republics. So Greece, though, isn't really conquered. Rome does conquer various territories and simply annex them as provinces, but it never quite does that with Greece. I mean, Macedon is uh, brought in, into line and, and then demolished as, mm. a, as, a, as a monarchy, but the Etonian League continue after uh, 168 and the Achaean League as, as well. But it is a big moment. Rome doesn't actually make Greece a Mm. province in 167, but they interfere substantially. There had been a great proclamation by the Roman general Flamininus that Greece was free in the 190s. So uh, at least notionally, Mm. uh, the Greeks are are free. Now, there's a war in 146, which we'll uh, come to. Yeah. Now, obviously... The defeat of the Macedonians at the Battle of Pydna in 168 sees Polybius end up in Rome. Why is it that Polybius, among other notable politicians, are brought to Rome? Are they brought as prisoners, or what exactly is their reasoning for mm-hmm. ending up mm-hmm. in Rome? I, well, I think it's it, it's it, it's pretty clear, really. They simply deport the leading politicians from Rome uh, to, to remove troublemakers. Well, mm-hmm. that, is, that would be the notion. To ensure there's not an uprising, yeah. in other words. I, well, I, just to leave Roman flunkies on the ground, mm-hmm. uh, they, they remove, we're told, a thousand uh, Achaean politicians and others from other places. So, I, I mean, they're, they're pretty annoyed in 168, 167 mm-hmm. uh, uh, about this war against Macedon. So, a pretty, pretty brutal response. Yeah. Um, and deporting anybody who might oppose Roman wishes mm-hmm. is simply a way of trying to control the situation and they cart them off to Rome. They're not, yes, they're not slaves. They're not enslaved. Yeah. As prisoners, well, we'll come to yeah. Polybius' status there. But so, sorry, yeah, to expand on that, they, they are going, when they are taken to Rome, obviously they're taken against their will, mm-hmm. but they're going with the knowledge that they will enjoy a reasonably comfortable standard of living. I, it, it, it's difficult to know. I mean, Polybius says that uh, most of his compatriots were packed off to Italian towns and mm. he wanted to be in Rome and was able to, to swing that. Mm-hmm. I, did they know what they were going to know? I don't think so. All, all they were told was, you're out of Greece. Uh, and I think that was the object of the exercise to... Yeah. But they, they weren't brought in chains, per se. They were, I, no, no. They were, no. I, yeah. the, the, they're under some sort of detention. I would think the big thing is they simply could not go to Greece. They would not put up with them in, in Greece. Greece. Because we know of all four or five missions the Achaeans sent to Rome to get Polybius back, to, or not just Polybius, but the other deportees to ask for them back. Eventually, Rome did. I think most of them had got old and died by that stage in 152 or 150, is it, somewhere around mm. there. So they wanted, the, the Achaeans wanted them back, which is interesting. And it's cl- pretty clear the Romans said, no, no, mm. they're, they're not going back. So, I, listen, it's just a... I, must be a, 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 a means of political mm. control. That's what was intended. I 
doubt it was intended to treat them badly. Um, Greek aristocrats would assume that they would be, I think, treated with civility by uh, the Roman... And obviously the, uh, the Roman upper classes all spoke Greek as their first language, so they didn't really have that barrier to get past, that they could all go and continue speaking Greek. Once, once well, I, yes, I mean, uh, whether they all did or not, uh, perhaps uh, a moot point, but Greek was, where are we? We're in the first half of the second century BC. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear that educated Romans were educated thoroughly in uh, Greek, in Greek literature and, mm -hmm. uh, and thought. Yes, it wouldn't be a, a, a strange uh, place to go at all, but uh, actually the, the mechanics of the life, we, we don't really know. I mean, was Polybius able to use his inherited family wealth to yeah. run an entire household? I mean, yeah. we just don't really know how it worked. We can tell from how he acted and his life in Rome that it was pretty free for him. If yeah. he was, at least notionally, under some form of detention in Rome, yeah. it didn't keep him there the whole time. Yeah. Now, he's, he's brought to Rome not long after the Second Punic War, which is possibly one of the most dangerous wars for the Romans that they come quite close to um, being obliterated. So, assumably, the Romans' attitude towards foreigners, particularly ones they fought and conquered, must be not favourable. Was Polybius received with any xenophobic sort of attitudes, or was he treated well? Was well, I, judging from what he says, and that's all we've got, um, I think he had a, a very good time in Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't have much negative uh, to say about his stay there, and he yeah. clearly enjoyed parts of it. We see him with the Seleucid prince, that's the Syrian uh, prince, Demetrius, who was kind mm -hmm. of under detention in Rome as well. They go yeah. off hunting uh, well outside Rome, he has dealings with the Locrians, so he has a degree of freedom. To what extent other deportees had this, we just don't know. Mm. In Polybius's case, uh, it was due to his connections, and that is a really important part of his stay there. He met mm. the Scipionic family yeah. there. Have a, a question I know on meeting yeah. familiar faces from the Roman gentry. Well, I, this is uh, these are the most famous Romans of their day, yeah. the uh, famous uh, Corneli Scipiones, that yeah. family. And he developed almost father-son-like relationship with young Scipio Emilianus, mm. who in the end the, was... The, the, the grandson of Scipio Africa. Uh, yes, this is the one who uh, conquers Carthage, yes. destroys Carthage. So he has the highest connections in uh, Rome, and they're able, it must be due to them, mm. that he's able to swing it that he's in Rome. And he, it seems to me anyway, is well received there. There's, he certainly doesn't talk of being badly treated. Yeah. So it's a very important time because yeah. Rome is the center of the world. Uh, and yeah. it is, there are constant embassies from princes, kings, yeah. cities, from all around the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we don't know perhaps when he starts to write history, but he's, I, I think, must be by this stage a historian, but mm. there could not be a better place to be than in Rome if yeah. you're writing the history of the Mediterranean, yeah. which is... So, obviously, sorry, he um, he moves, he, he, he writes this fantastic history, but other than that, does he enjoy any huge successes while in Rome? Is he really, really liked by the time he's sort of writing? And I mean, do the, the politicians almost see him as an equal? I, I don't know. We do hear of him uh, relating to other uh, Romans, leading Romans. Uh, so he, he was part of this. He must have been part of the scenery. I mean, mm. he was part yeah. of this leading group. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And then when Scipio yeah. uh, goes to uh, Africa in 152, 151, he's in Spain at the time. And Polybius tells us that he interviewed the Numidian king Massinissa face to face. Now, mm. I mean, it's not absolutely clear, but I'm pretty sure he must have gone with Scipio yeah. to Africa. Scipio was looking for elephants uh. and interviewed uh, Massinissa. And we know that he, at some stage, travelled Hannibal's route 
from Spain to across the Alps, it, across the Alps uh, from Spain to Italy. And in the obvious time to assume it is when he's coming back mm. from that trip. So he, he would appear to be a, a very close associate mm. of Scipio Aemilianus, and that would put him among the leading Romans of the day. Um, yeah. It's a pretty important place. Now, I don't think he's, it becomes in any sense a Roman politician, so when you ask mm. about successors, well, I mean, I think I mentioned he, he advised the uh, South Italian town of Locri, they asked for advice, yeah. and he seems to have uh, won them concessions. Mm. But how, how politicised he was, um, it, difficult to say. He, he talks, uh, I mentioned this uh, Seleucid uh, Prince Demetrius, who mm. escapes from Rome, and, and Polybius uh, describes his escape from Rome and says that he devised it. Mm. And that would seem very unlikely if it wasn't supported by mm. uh, certainly sections of the, the Roman aristocracy mm. and particularly the Scipion, the leading mm. political uh, figures. But that's not the same as political activity. He's not acting as a politician. He's really um, mixing with the elite, the Roman elite, uh, and obviously from what he says anyway, he got on very well with them. Yeah. And does he, um, I mean, obviously the big thing for anyone living in Rome was the eventual right to be a citizen. Do we know if he was ever awarded citizenship or did he? No, not, uh, I, I don't think he would see any advantage in that. I mean, he remains okay. a very proud Greek. Uh, after the war that the yeah. Achaean League fight in 146 that ends with the destruction of the Achaean League mm -hmm. and the destruction of Corinth. Polybius is very much part of the rebuilding mm -hmm. process of Greece, and he, he thought that was one of his greatest achievements. So yes. at that stage, he, he obviously is a trusted uh, friend of the Romans, yeah. so that this is somebody who can help in reconstructing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, uh, again, a bit off topic. What dialect of Greek does he write in? Uh, Doric, considering he's from the Peloponnese, or does he write in Athenic? Uh, which, no, which, which, which dialect does he it, choose it, to write it's, in? It's really the, 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 the Koine, the... The, the cur yeah, Corinthian, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, I mean, it's a mixture of things, but it, it's a very sort of standard form. It's not a, an extreme dialect at all. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the language that... Greek on the whole becomes, apart yeah. from local pockets, yes, obviously like Doric, but no, mm. it's uh, it's kind of standard written Greek of, of the mm. period. So it would appear to me anyway that he grew to like Rome despite being carted off as a prisoner of it. I, yes, I, I mean, he, he's a great admirer of Rome. Polybius' attitude to Rome is one of the things uh, that we could discuss in great detail because he is highly critical of certain individuals and particular actions. But there's no doubt, I mean, he starts the whole work with, with a question saying, yeah. who could not be interested? You, you need to be a, a, a complete sort of non-interested person if yeah. you were excited by the story of Rome's rise to imperial Yeah, power. and are his writings, are they biased? Do they display a notable bias towards the favour of Rome? I mean... It's a complicated question. Um, he, he writes very largely in praise of Rome. Mm. Uh, the, the reason for their rise to world power is, at one level anyway, completely humanistic. They just do everything well. Their religion mm. is spot on, their state, they run their state, their constitution, um, uh, their army, uh, and by courage, perseverance, and uh, all the best, most highly prized qualities mm. uh, of the day, the Romans were the best. So they get where they get uh, by their own excellence. Yeah. And, and that, that's not necessarily entirely unqualified mm -hmm. praise. Uh, yes, yeah. he admires Rome hugely. They have the best constitution. They have a mixed constitution. Mm -hmm. We'll come to that later, maybe. So, yes, he admires Rome, but uh, he is critical of, of individuals and of, yeah. of things they do. So, it's slightly ambiguous. People would argue quite a lot, really. Mm. Uh, was he very pro-Roman or less pro-Roman? Mm. One approach you can take, which is an interesting one, is does he really say what he thinks? Mm. 
And indeed, could he say what he thinks? You could view all his pronouncements on imperialism and uh, Rome's uh, rise to power and how they've achieved it and what they do right or wrong. You could say that oh, he doesn't mean any of it that mm. way because he can't say what he really feels. Yeah. I, 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 I'm attracted to this, this notion, but also slightly wary of it, that you end up with something where he, he means something entirely different from what he says. Mm. Now, that there might be an element mm. of that. But, um, Do we know if the Roman elite ever decide, oh, let's translate this into Latin and read it aloud to sort of display our grandeur and in increase our popularity among the, the working classes in Rome? No. Uh, I mean, the answer is we don't know. So it, it um, never actually leaves yeah. Greek in the period of classical antiquity then? It never which? It never sort of leaves Greek. It never gets translated uh, out of Greek. It, well, not, in, uh, not until much later, to medieval times. Mm. But who's it for is, is the question you're asking. And, I, I mean, it's not for the ordinary people mm. of Greece, Rome, or the Mediterranean. It is some attempt to explain uh, Rome to everybody else in the Mediterranean. Does that mean the audience is entirely Greek? Well, no, I don't think so. He's writing yeah. for the educated elite of the Greek and so Roman world. Do you think he wrote for much the same reasons as Thucydides, so that these things get preserved, they don't die out? I mean, that's Thucydides' main reason. I think he states it in his opening paragraph, even, that his main reason to write is to ensure that history is documented. Herodotus says the same thing, yeah, although yeah, he, he admits yeah. that he's more journalistic. Do you think Polybius did the same thing and that he wanted it to last for a great period of time so that people could read it and mm. uh, appreciate? Oh, I, yes, I do. I, I, and he, he certainly knew uh, Thucydides and would have the same aims. I, I mean, what does he think about his history? Well, one of the things he thinks about it is uh, that it is useful. Yeah. If it is right, if it is true, if it is accurate, yeah. then it is, uh, in a practical yeah. sense, useful. Not in some wider philosophical sense, but uh, for a, po a politician has to be a historian mm -hmm. to be a successful politician. Yeah. A historian has to be a politician, in, mm. his, in his view. It, the usefulness of history is something he mentions early on in the work and repeatedly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really important uh, that, but it, it, it's also important yeah. that in order to be useful, you have to meet yeah. his standards of trustworthiness, accuracy, mm -hmm. careful checking, and so on. And so obviously then, you said he, he knew Thucydides, so the Oral not knew him personally, obviously there was a few hundred years uh, between the two, but he obviously grew up studying Thucydides, he probably studied Herodotus, he probably even studied poets like Homer and was fascinated by warfare. From that aspect, do you think that that really did have a huge influence on why he wrote? It, well, yes. He, he is very well aware that he is in a, uh, a long and distinguished tradition mm -hmm. of, of history writing. I don't have any doubt about that. He was uh, an educated Greek aristocrat. Mm -hmm. There's no question that he knew as Homer, and, and he makes Homer references. Mm -hmm. uh, he regards Odysseus as the, the, the perfect, versatile man, and he regards himself as a sort of Homer and Odysseus. <laughs> um, so the, yeah. the extent to which past literature is, is part of his psyche is, is disputed. I mean, yeah. I believe that he knew Thucydides yeah. well, and actually Herodotus usually yeah. assumed that he was not close to associated with Herodotus. I, I think there's evidence that he owed more to Herodotus than, than people have said, but he is a, a yeah. product of the second century BC, yeah. so Herodotus is a long time before, and, and Thucydides. Um, but actually yeah. Herodotus is interesting because he's also somebody who talks out loud a lot, thinks out loud rather, about uh, what he was doing, yeah. and I think he's influential in that yeah. way. Thucydides, it lurks there in various uh, ways as well. And I, I suppose, moving on from that, I, uh, every time I interview someone about a particular person in history that they've studied, I uh, interviewed David Newell, who's a PhD student in um, UCD most recently, and he's doing his thesis on Alcibiades, and I have to ask him the same question. If you were given the opportunity, not necessarily just because you'd studied him, but because you wanted to have an enjoyable meal with someone, do you think that 
Polybius, from your understanding, would have been a nice guy to sit down with and <laughs> have dinner with. It's a bit more of an obscure yeah. question, but I think it's a yeah. yeah no, I know. Uh, I, I, I well, I mean, I think he's an extremely interesting writer because he deals with a huge variety of material. I mean, there's observations mm. on all sorts of things. And uh, now you could think he was a bit of a bluff old general uh, mm. or military type uh, as he got older. Mm. Uh, but actually, he had an extraordinary life. We've seen enough already to see he had this uh, glowing early career mm. cut short by deportation to Rome, but at Rome becomes part of the elite set. Mm. So, I mean, he, he spends his life, his adult life, with mm. all the most powerful people in the world. It's a, that, you know, that's an amazing mm. um, situation. He witnesses great battles and sieges. Yeah. He goes back to Greece and is involved in its reconstruction after the uh, disastrous Achaean War of 146. Mm. He is a big player um, yeah. and had, had lived an extraordinary life. So I, I think he would have been. I mean, yeah. he's a person of pretty pronounced opinions. Yeah. Uh, so um, at dinner, one could see him being forceful and you'd have to <laughs> argue your case, but um, really an extraordinary mm -hmm. and interesting life. Now, one of the topics that Polybius is, focuses on, obviously, the or, or the, the early Roman Republic and their successes, is the Punic Wars. And he's probably, would I be correct in saying, the closest thing to a primary source we have in the Punic Wars. Of course, he is alive and present during the Third Punic War. Yeah. If he's born in 200 BC, yes, he, he is pretty close to even the Hannibalic War. I mean, mm. as he was uh, uh, growing up, that would have been the big memory yeah. that he grew up with as yeah. a boy, the uh, heroic, in the end, yeah. victory over Hannibal. And did he ever, I mean, I know he meets Scipio Aemilianus, who's the grandson of Scipio Africanus. Does he get to Rome by the time that, uh, before Scipio Africanus dies, does he ever meet, meet the, the famous general Africanus? Or? Not that we... No. No. He, but he, obviously, he writes in detail about the... Uh, the Second Punic War, the war mm -hmm. against Hannibal, which we have only to, as I say, the Battle of Cannae. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see, even from what there is, that it's an extremely important account. Now, we have bits after that. Uh, we don't have a great deal of uh, the war against Perseus the, the Third Macedonian mm. War, uh, but we have fragments from throughout. So every now and again you get chunks. Yeah. I mean, he, we do have chunks about uh, Perseus. Um, so yes, he is. I mean, you asked at the beginning why he's important. Well, he is the big chronicler, really, of, mm. of Rome's rise to world power in the second century BC. I mean, mm. it's frustrating that we don't have the whole lot, mm. uh, that we only have bits and pieces and then excerpts, extensive chunks yeah. from this, uh, from later Byzantine summaries. So he, he is, yes, he is, a, mm. he, obviously he's a, a primary source for a, a large chunk of the, the second century BC, in many ways the most dramatic period in Rome's mm. history from uh, that victory over Hannibal to the next 50 years, which is what he's mm. rising, uh, writing about. I mean, Rome takes on the big players that nobody thought they would have been yeah. beforehand able to deal with, and they defeat them all. At the end of the period that, um, where, where Polybius stops in 146, it's clear that dominance in the Mediterranean has been established. That doesn't mean that Rome has a, uh, a geographical empire everywhere, but they are the guys. You do what they say, or mm -hmm. you face uh, defeat, uh, or you would face military action. Yeah. Uh, actually, that's achieved in 167. His original plan, the original plan of his work, was to finish in 167, and that is achieved in the first 30 books, is it? Is it books? Yes. Um, and then uh, he extends the plan to include the following 20 years mm. to see and make a judgment, well, how does Rome yeah. use, uh, use this power? So yeah. yes, he is a contemporary source, and that's why yeah. he's so important. Now, obviously, his writings are what make him famous. What age is he when he takes up the task of starting his writings 
and what age is he roughly when he finishes? Now, I know obviously we're unsure about his ages, but just sort of within sort of five, ten years, do we know? Yes, well, uh, do we? They, there's, a, there's a great deal of work about um, when he writes various books, different layers of, of, of composition, and it's a complicated, complicated story because he's clearly... I mean, there are 40 books. Uh, it's mm. not the same as 40 modern books, but it's a huge mm. chunk of work. In order to do that, he must have been doing it for you know, large chunks of his life. Mm. When he actually starts... Well, we don't know exactly mm. at what period he starts writing. I mean, when he's in Rome, he must be writing already heavily. And before that, uh, I think he must have started. Uh, when he shipped off to Rome, uh, we're in 167, so he's 32, somewhere oh, around there, yeah. early 30s. But he must be writing then. When he finishes the work in, when, when it breaks off in 146, mm. no, that, that's the end of it. He lives for another, or... Oh, 26, 28 years. And there are, there are references that he's still right, dealing with this work, his history, in 118 BC, or it mm. seems to be the case. Now, he, he wrote other things. So it looks to be a, an account of Scipio's campaign against the, the Spanish city of Numantia. And there's that work on tactics. You know, the work on tactics must have been completed before the histories because mm. he, he mentions it he mentions in the it, histories. So, uh, when is he doing his writing? Well, I, I mean, I, I suppose all that's useful to say is that he must at some stage decide that he has got to write this account. Mm. He doesn't say when. Well, at the age of 20, I decided I must recount this uh, wonderful uh, story. Uh, the, I suppose, well, no, introductions can be misleading because you, uh, in, a, in a way, you can only write the introduction mm at the end, yeah. uh, for secure, when he says, well, I originally intended to write to 167, but then I extended it to 146. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's writing that when he's completed it. So it, it's, it's a complicated issue, when he wrote what. Mm -hmm. um, I don't find it a very productive one on the whole. Mm -hmm. I don't see that we've got very far, that, mm. that it tells us very much. Yeah. So does he display a problem that we are typically faced with when studying ancient historians of only knowing bits about his personal life through his writings? We get this with uh, historians like Herodotus, Thucydides, I suppose, uh, Plutarch to a lesser extent. Does Polybius display the same problems? And I mean, does he, do we know much about his personal life? Did he have any wife? Uh, did he have a wife or did he have any children? Yes, we were talking about that before. I, I, can't for the life of me remember any reference to uh, a wife and family other than that is <coughs> a family of birth. I, yeah, we, we, there are ins inscriptions that, mm -hmm. uh, that refer to uh, Polybius, but really we uh, know what we know about him through what he says. Now, what he says is a lot, a lot of personal thoughts and a lot of personal information about his time in Rome and so on, and his entire career. Uh, I mean, all the things we know of crossing the Alps, he also uh, borrowed a boat from Scipio and sailed into the Atlantic. It, all this comes from him. So, so do you think he... I mean, this is, this is quite sort of a, an odd thing to suggest, but do you think some of this things that he tells us about himself could be made up to sort of seem, make himself seem better? Oh, I, I, I don't have any, any doubt. I mean, it's impossible <laughs> for uh, uh, people, in a way, uh, not to do that. Yeah. Um, he, he, he's not writing military memoirs in a way that maybe Sulla did, but actually he, he's still writing about his own career. Mm. And yes, I, I mean, one of the things he does do that other historians don't, is that he writes himself centrally into the story. As the events progress, he, he, he gets to be older and he becomes a, a player in the events, especially after 167 mm. and after even in the reconstruction of Greece in the, in the 140s. So we know quite a lot about him from what he says. How reliable that is, you just have to look at each instance, mm. really. Um, I have no doubt that he boosts his own, yeah. the impression he gives of himself. I mean, he, he's hugely critical of other writers, mm. uh, especially the Sicilian author Timaeus, mm. a, a scathing attack on, 
on uh, Timaeus in Book 12. Mm. Now, partly that's to do with saying, no, he doesn't know how to do it. I know how to do it. So it's establishing your authority yeah. as a historian. And then he also attacks the um, very interesting person we don't know a lot about, Pythias, Pythias of uh, Marseille, mm. who was the first Greek person we know to circumnavigate Britain. Mm. And Polybius rubbishes his achievements and says, oh, that's obviously complete fabrication, he can't have done that. And again... But yet I've sailed into the Atlantic. <laughs> yeah, well, he said, no, I know. Uh, well, what it is, is really established, no, I'm the guy you pay attention to. No, uh, if you think PDS is uh, uh, hot stuff, uh, no, I'm afraid you're wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm the expert on mm. this. So, uh, I mean, there is always that yeah. problem with an author writing about themselves, yeah. how much is exaggeration and yeah. Clearly, uh, a lot of certainly mm -hmm. his authority as a historian is is created by criticizing mm. others. Does Polybius, or do we know if Polybius ever actually gets to return home to Greece before he dies, or does he spend all this time in Rome? No, he 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 goes back. I mean, uh, he we're, we're told in a not very reliable source that he died at the age of eighty-two while riding back home. He falls off his horse. So after the work finishes, we don't know much about uh, Polybius, which is quite a long period. Yeah. He mentions himself um, that he was in Alexandria. We hear a report that he was in Rome. He, he, he must have moved around, yeah. but I, I suspect he was writing yeah. history. For a lot of this yeah. time, so we don't know a, yeah. a great deal about his time. But yeah. I, I mean, unlike the Jewish historian Josephus, who also went off to Rome, was he carted off to a certain extent? Yes, Josephus never went back to Judea, yeah. uh, as far as we know. Polybius did. Yes, he was involved in the re-establishment of order and um, new constitutions after. The revolt of the Achaean mm. League. We haven't talked about that, but this was a great disaster. Uh, the Achaeans revolted against Rome, and that mm. puts an end to them. What age does you said? Sorry, you said yeah, there yeah. that he dies. A, in a, a, he well, dies that's in the report. He dies, uh, which is exceedingly ancient, old for the ancient very, world. Very old. Do we know much about his later life, or is that quite convoluted? Because we've lost most of his work, which was the source no, for his life. We just don't. We don't just know don't very much. Is is the answer? Um, yeah. And we don't know exactly yeah. when he died, that, that's yeah. disputed. But if you say he was born in yeah. 200 and was uh, and um, was 82, then obviously yeah. you come somewhere around 180. Now, this is sort of a question that brings us right up into today, and I suppose one that you probably would be the best man to answer the question. How were his writings viewed after his death? I speak sort of in, I suppose, a more narrow sense about in Rome and through the late Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And then I also speak up through sort of the Renaissance and the Middle Ages, and then right up to today to mm -hmm. this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, it is a good question and it's an interesting subject. He, he is referred to by various Roman authors, Greek and Roman authors uh, in subsequent centuries. Uh, not, not heavily, I mean, not to the extent that Rhodes and Thucydides were sort of part of the, the great historical or history mm -hmm. writing establishment. But he, he is there, he, he's mentioned yeah. uh, as uh, highly reliable on Greek history. An author that I'm interested in, uh, Appian of Alexandria, who um, was writing the second century AD, mm -hmm. in my opinion, fairly clearly uses him. Uh, fairly extensively. So he, he was there and used, and uh, the great writer who used him was Livy, uh, mm -hmm. the Roman historian Livy, and we can track that where we have passages of mm -hmm. Polybius, passages of Livy that clearly use the Polybian original. Yeah. So, I mean, Livy was the, his great, uh, in many ways, his immediate apotheosis. Mm -hmm. Livy adopted him, and it might be that actually Livy ensured his reputation. Mm. As time goes on, he is mentioned less often. I, I suppose his life in the, the New World picks up with Machiavelli, and uh, who does uh, use him, not in The Prince, mm. in uh, his other major work on, on Livy. And he is then, once Machiavelli picks him up, he then becomes part of the European tradition, the mm. uh, Florentine 
uh, tradition of political science, the French, and he does uh, end up as uh, one of the team of ancient writers that the founders of the American Constitution used very mm. heavily. John Adams, the second president of the United mm. States, thought Polybius was the greatest Best. writer. <laughs> what they're picking up, we haven't discussed, it's a huge uh, matter, is what he wrote about constitutions, mm. um, and particularly a mixed constitution that Polybius argued that Rome was a mixture of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, and that was hugely attractive to the founders of the, the, founders the American of the Constitution. Okay. In the modern era, he is still somebody that, that occurs yeah. in political science works, actually, for that reason, not so much for the, the history mm. that interests us as professional yeah. classicists, but actually for what he writes about constitutions. Mm. So book six really is why he is famous yeah. in, in the modern world. Well, that brings us nicely to the end of the podcast. Professor McGing, thank you very much for joining me today and giving us a fantastic overview of Polybius. Of course, if you are interested in reading Professor McGing's book on Polybius, a link will be available in the description. If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to find out more or get involved with Classical Youth Society of Ireland, you can contact us via our social media pages on www.facebook.com forward slash Classical Youth Society Ireland. If Facebook isn't your thing, you can follow us on Twitter at CYSI underscore, or for any direct inquiries, you can email us cysiofficial at gmail.com. Today's podcast was produced by myself and edited by Michael Fuller. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you all next time.